Well, that's the first uh, vlog, or I should say, uh, I guess, audio vlog um, that I've ever recorded. So that was fun. Complexity and totalitarianism. Um, like I said, I was having a discussion with somebody, and they, they were saying basically that they think that the global market and so forth, and that includes, at least in the context of this conversation, that, that included, um, you know, sort of the global operation itself, you know, in the context of nation states, in the context of globalism, um, which which the global market uh, is is sort of advancing at, at its own pace, I suppose. But there, there are these people which, uh, you know, termed globalists, and they want to accelerate it. Now, why they want to accelerate it, I'm not really sure because I think that it's going apace uh, just simply just simply through regular market economics and nation states and everything that I described in that video um, I, I don't really want this to be a discussion of that but you know I just made it it's my first one it's pretty cool uh, but yeah so that, that that was the gist of it and so my argument was essentially the thesis that I, I wrote out and that's kind of why it sounded a little bit mm, I don't know robotic uh, I, I paused and stuff a lot, so I had to trim a bit and kind of do a few takes and cuts and stuff because, I don't know, reading stuff, it's not really a train of thought. you got to you know, try to read it in a way at least that sounds somewhat good, I guess. <laughs> it sounded okay to me. I, I think I can do better. I'm going to have to learn. My first time. Give me a break. Um, but, yeah, so, you know, the, the globalist uh, sort of push, and, and we see it everywhere now, and it's no longer a, a crazy... Alex Jones, gay frogs, kind of, you know, conspiracy theory thing now. These people are globalists. We know what they want. We know what their aims are. We see it in Brexit. Um, you know, basically the, the parliament now is, uh, in Britain, is revolting against the prime minister in order to stop the no-deal Brexit when the European Union definitely is not going to give them any kind of deal other than essentially slavery from everything that I've read and looked at. Um, and so there, there you go. You, you, you see that 21 Tories turned against uh, turned against their, their prime minister and got kicked out of the Tory party. And now it really is a constitutional crisis because the Queen signed off on that. Anyway, so you see, you know, you, you see that these people are globalists. Then the European Union is just one uh, aspect of them trying to centralize uh, control of many things, in, in particular with the EU, the, the main thing, of course, being um, more on the economic side and then also like regulations, including regulating speech. Uh, America is still one of the only free countries in the world. It's certainly, you know, the most powerful and blah, blah, blah of them. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the nationalism versus globalism debate, and, and I really hate how the, the, the globalist slash many of them socialist, I don't think all globalists are socialists, but the ones that we're seeing right now definitely are, um, you know, they, they want to increase this, this sort of global centralization of political power, um, the economic power, it seems to be concentrating in their hands, of course, you know, there, there's always that motivation uh, to to gain uh, wealth and so forth, and we see that pretty clearly. People like the Clintons and other people who magically, oh, Nancy Pelosi, <laughs> magically uh, got rich in office, uh, you know, on a, on, a, on a congressperson's or senator's salary or something like that. Um, Obama just bought a $14 million beachfront mansion. And so, yeah, it's it, there are globalists. We see it with the Brexit. The European Union is a big part of this, and there, I, from what I see, there's a lot of ties with China there. And yeah, and what you know, the European Union is more regulatory, more trying to deal with the economic side of things and everything like that. Whereas when we get to the Chinese, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, um, they're getting into the territory, the the sort of 1984 esque territory of you know the social credit and all of this and that's that's also a really scary thing and i think a lot of people who follow this this you know debate globalism nationalism what's you know and, and let's assume you're not an ex extremist on either side i mean i would say i'm i'm partially a nationalist of course you know 
there's there's civic nationalism whereas you know if if my country needs me and all of that i understand uh and there's there's nationalism nationalism hardcore you know fascist style or communist style the soviet union was highly nationalistic the the chinese communist party is definitely highly nationalistic it's na they're national communists uh, national socialism essentially it's it's funny how those two things do end up blending into one another um, especially in China. It's an excellent example of just hardcore, full-on communism going to going in, becoming essentially a fascist system, which is what it pretty much is right now. I don't think anybody would say that China is free. Um, so you got this, this globalization movement um, and, and groups such as, for example, the EU working with, in many ways, uh, the Chinese and sort of, uh, in that sense, of course, undermining the United States. Uh, in the process in many ways you know helping them when you know we're, we're trying to have a tariff war with them whether you think that's a good idea or not um you know maybe it is maybe it isn't i'm i'm a bit on the fence as to whether or not it is but it could be i mean and that's the thing and that's why i was talking about complex uh, adaptive systems and complex systems because you know th that's the way that markets actually work um oh who was the guy it was for the Santa Fe Institute. I'd have to look it up. The Santa Fe Institute, um, oh, what was his name? He did the virtual stock market way back in like the late 80s. And, and then he went and took that to Wall Street and he, he made millions. J, J, J. Dion Farmer is his name. J. Dion Farmer. It's spelled weird. It smelled like Dion. Anyways, so yeah, J. Dion Farmer. And, and he made that artificial stock market thing and he went and took it to wall street and he made millions of dollars and then of course other people figured out his trick i mean he published the papers and stuff but you know other other market people probably weren't um keen <laughs> keen enough on the math that he was one of the only people in the world uh to know and he made a killing um and so markets work this way just as i was saying like all these different things work this way. biological evolution uh, kaufman i mean it's it's an unbelievable unbelievably powerful um tool uh mathematically and it you know through, through the i don't know this it starts in the 60s kind of but it's more like later 70s definitely and and the main research i'd say mid 70s through late 80s was the main research for that went into like complex adaptive systems theory the basic stuff the the primary stuff and so yeah I, we have to be very careful about that sort of thing but we also have to realize that we are in a complex system including economically trade war with china could be beneficial it could be very bad as well so you can't do anything without taking a risk so the global order you know and all of this sort of stuff we see this globalism uh, encroaching as it were and we're seeing a nationalist uh, backlash and and of course people fear i mean probably rightly to some degree uh, of of overcorrection, um, that's that's a pretty reasonable fear to have, I'd say. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't think that a large number of people in Western countries are going to suddenly become Nazis. What I do see happening is a lot of people um, becoming communists, uh, which are just as violent and pretty much always end up in fascism anyway, as we see particularly with China anyway. So I guess the question is, you know, if you're not an, if you're not an extremist, you know, globalist, which is getting more extreme and more apparently popular, especially given Brexit, um, or the other, you know, more nationalist. I mean, we see this throughout Europe. You know, obviously Trump got elected. There's a bunch of that stuff going on. And so, yeah, I mean, there, there is going to be an equal and opposite reaction. I think, well, from my perspective, the main problem is the overreaction on one of the sides, not to say that the, the quote-unquote right, and this, the political dichotomy on a line doesn't make sense, the, the one-dimensional right-left, but, you know, that's why we've got different uh, dimensional scales of that, uh, political compasses and so forth, which are probably better. But, yeah, I mean... The, if you're not an extremist in terms of, oh, we need no, open borders, right? That, that's an extremist position. I, I would say I, it's, it's got to be the media because, you know, I just, it doesn't make any sense. It, it seems like a massive brainwashing campaign. 
um, by specific political interests, many of which have a lot of media power, we'll say. So it just boggles my mind, essentially, that, that so many people now are just screaming for open borders and all this stuff, not even understanding the ramifications. You know, I mean, you've got people, you know, with Brexit saying, oh, if we, if we leave this, uh, we're, we're going to, it's going to destroy our economy or whatever. And completely ignoring the economic downsides of the other side. So, and we see this on both sides probably too, but you know, there's facts and then there's, I don't know, it's getting all muddled. Both sides are coming up with fake stuff and that's bogus. And so you got to cut through it, but that's, you know, you just have to have a good research regimen. You have to actually do the research and that's what i see and this, this is another aspect too and this I, I don't know this is one reason i think that i had complexity theory on the brain other than the fact that i studied it for a really long time um you know we, trump with the weather uh graph right oh this oh he extended the hurricane da 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 it's like yeah because you don't know what's gonna happen these I, I, it's it's amazing to me to see the entire country somehow overnight overnight decide that weather forecasts are accurate like a hundred percent accurate and if you think that they're not then you're a crazy lunatic liar idiot or something I don't know what the hell they're yeah Trump Trump basically uh, lied to the American people supposedly in order to about where a hurricane was gonna land in order to do what <laughs> like a James Bond villain. He's like, I know what I'll do today. You know, I'll I'll, I'll lie to the American people about where, the, where this hurricane's going to hit. Ha 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 ha. Like, what? What kind of deranged lunatic do you have to be to believe something like that? And second of all, it's, it's perfectly understandable to, to extend that that trajectory of that hurricane because there's, okay, so there's, there's multiple models. You, everybody's seen the spaghetti models, right? But along with the spaghetti models, which are complex adaptive system uh, based forecasting, now it's more toward the chaotic end because it's weather. Climate models are CAS models, period. Full on. Um, uh, so there's, there, it's, it's, it's a range. Um, it's, it's a range within systems theory, right? So dynamical systems theory, you've got, you've got chaos, and then it's, it's sort of a gradation. Uh, Kaufman goes way into this in Origins of Order, but it's sort of a gradation and, and you go from, um, well, let's start on the other side, order. So when you introduce uh, some randomness, you get what's called an ordered regime. An ordered regime basically gets frozen. So it, it's not frozen at first, but it always freezes. That's, that's the definition of an ordered regime. It always freezes and it just dies. It, it, basically it's frozen, it doesn't move anymore. Um, and then, you know, after that, you get into the complex regime, uh, which is a mixture of order and chaos. And then when you go all the way through the complexity regime, you get to the chaotic regime in which it, it's, it's infinitely divergent. Now, there's still a spectrum because, it, you know, you can rank it by how quickly the system diverges, um, well, you know, over many trials with different initial conditions. It's, it's a bunch of math stuff. So with regard to hurricanes, you know, everybody's seen the spaghetti models and, but there's another graph that goes along with spaghetti models that shows over time, you know, what the predicted category of the hurricane would be, what the wind speed will be, stuff like that. And you'll see, if you look at, you're supposed to look at both of these charts at the same time and you'll see, you know, that a lot of, a lot of the spaghetti tracks are going to, are going to weaken or, or a lot of them are going to strengthen. Um, sometimes not, but usually, uh, and, and you'll see with the spaghetti models. Now, the assumption is that the spaghetti models where they converge is where the thing's going to go. But if you just watch any hurricane or big storm or anything that has spaghetti models, probably just hurricanes and typhoons, um, you're, you're going to see that it, it changes quite a bit over time. And that was what happened here. Now the media went crazy. Of course, they've just got, you know, their, their Trump derangement syndrome. This is not really a faux pas, and I think that's why he's not letting it go. And everybody's like, oh, he's not letting it go. It's like, yeah, because you're you're literally lying about the mathematics and the modeling and the accuracy. I mean, you're literally saying that a weather report is accurate. <laughs> like, oh, it's not going to rain today. Oh, it's raining. You know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous to think that. And so, I mean, so weather models, we've got 
pretty good, pretty good. Uh, not, we're not talking about hurricanes and stuff, but just regular weather when stuff is kind of normal. We've got about three days. We're pretty accurate, somewhat. After that, not really great. Now that's extended. It used to just be a day, you know. I mean, at the you know at the very most kind of thing. So we've gotten better, but you know, three days is. And then when you get into climate models, again, these are they're not completely different. They're 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 based on the same mathematics for the most part. Um, obviously, nonlinear systems um, models. You know, you run them over and over again, uh, and then see where they converge. And again, that's why the the spaghetti models are like that. Where where you see most of the spaghetti models, probably where the thing is going to go, but not necessarily. And so the idea, oh, with Trump. Uh, said, oh, we, we better mobilize in Alabama. Well, why the hell shouldn't the president say, oh, hey, you know, let's let's be ready for black swans is what they're called. Uh, they're generally called black swans. There's a guy you should not listen to named uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And I, I just, I don't like the guy myself because I think he, I, he makes too much of a deal. He basically says nothing's predictable and that's not true. But then what the media is doing with this whole BS thing with, with Trump and his hurricane thing, that's not true either. <laughs> Weather models, if you know how they work, if you've ever designed one, or at least at least a rudimentary one I've designed, not, you know. Uh, but, but yeah, if you've ever designed one from the ground up or tried to do a linear one and then it turns recursive, you start to, it, it, when you actually do it, it really, you see what that means. And that's the problem is that, People don't understand that. Now, this also goes into the climate debate, which, you know, of course, they just had the big town hall recently here, uh, or whatever, the, the debate, sorry, not, you know, whatever. They call it a town hall. I don't know. It's branding. <laughs> the, to the town hall debates. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, they just had the, the climate thing with the Democrats, and oh my God, you know, the amount of actual forcing effect of CO2. Uh, and I, I would say actually more importantly, probably methane, especially given the clathrate bomb hypothesis and what's going on in Siberia and the Arctic shelf. Uh, you know, the actual forcing effect is not really known. And the, the, the reason is, I mean, we've got all these, these different climates and biomes and everything across the planet. We've got massive amounts of interaction between, uh, you know, just different different biological aspects of, of plants and animals and corals and you know just living organisms and we've got rainforests and deserts and all this sort of stuff and it's very complex and it it affects the climate and the climate affects it and it's a big problem i mean you know when you when you start talking about lin so like the cow farts right the cow farts that's a very linear thing it's like oh we're, the cows are putting methane in yeah i mean you know you can demonstrate that it, it's a positive methane, you know, amount of methane and so forth, but compared to what's leaking out of the ocean right now, you know, um, the real issue I, I would say with regard to CO2 emissions, carbon emissions is actually, I would say most of it would be ocean acidification. Uh, that's probably the actually the, the most, the most detrimental, uh, aspect I would say at, so far, right? And that isn't really a problem for the far future because as it, as that happens uh, in the oceans, let's say warm, uh, assuming that because they're going to start they're going to start outgassing the relationship between uh, the amount of carbon dioxide that can dissolve in the water uh, versus you know you know that is what it can hold versus the temperature. You know that's that's a temperature dependent thing, and as it warms, of course, it would outgas, and that would increase the temperature uh, as well, and cause more outgassing. So there is a possibility of runaway effects and all these sorts of things, but we're not seeing it, and that's the thing because you remember the original models from the IP, uh, uh, sorry, the International Panel on Climate Change, um, IPCC. That's right. So the 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 original models or the initial models or many of the models for many years were really catastrophic and they keep having to revise them down now of course you know people who are actual climate change deniers i'm not uh i i'm quite sure that carbon dioxide has a forcing effect in the atmosphere and you know methane has 20 times more um the question is not whether or not that's true it's whether or not 
or it's it's how much and what are the mitigating factors and what is the response of the earth because if if it was that susceptible to such a small perturbation on a you know on on a historical you know paleo historical scale then we would be like all dead right now already you know the earth has gone through all sorts of cycles so i'm not very convinced that it is it's not that metastable and so this is what's called metastability um and it's it's different from a symmetry because it's not a symmetry but so that's what i'm saying the, the people who are talking about these things are not scientists and, and a lot of the scientists that these people will bring out are um maybe they're technically climate scientists but you know who's paying them etc and then they seem to be some of them seem to be extremely political the answer i think the answer to the climate question right now in terms of the amount of forcing of co2 is we don't know and again that that gets back into this um th that issue of people not understanding what complex systems are what kind even you know remotely what kind of math these models use and what it means and what it means is, you know scientists are supposed to be quite happy to say i don't know and i'm quite happy to say i don't know when i don't because that's that's the point where that's where you do your research if you don't know something then you know you might want to know it and science is is defined by the edges primarily and that, that that has detrimental effects somewhat as well in science because you know people focus on the things we don't know they focus on new stuff and then nobody repeats experiments you know nobody uh is is redoing each other's experiments and that, that's become a huge problem actually there, there are now entire groups uh, that are designed uh, that have designed themselves essentially to um, redo other people's experiments uh, like like you're supposed to but of course no PhD you know uh, upcoming professor who needs to publish or perish uh, is going to not do the edge stuff and go and repeat other people's stuff to see if their thing was right that's not really how it works um, they want to do their own stuff. They want to do something different and new and then pushing the envelope. So that's a big problem in science. And, you know, uh, you have to know in particular, the, the first thing you need to know in science is to, is, is knowing what you don't know, because you're going to make a much worse and a lot more mistakes and get nowhere and waste your time and and come up with crappy data that that actually doesn't tell you what you need to know uh if you don't know what you don't know let's say i don't know rumsfeld's coming <laughs> there are no knowns and there are unknown unknowns we, we don't know um but that is true i know it's, it's kind of funny people <laughs> people people make fun of you if you if you quote rumsfeld on that but actually it turned out to be very very succinct way of saying something very very important it just sounds funny and it sounds stupid but it's actually quite profound um unlike probably unlike the man who said it and he probably got it from some great general or something and stole it i would assume maybe so yeah back to yeah the, the whole problem of this and globalism globalism ties into this as well uh, again back to the back to the start you know back to the back to the front there which is all of these things in terms of actual science uh from you know war and stuff and again i, I would point to the santa fe institute uh, i should leave a link in the description I, I should remind myself of that because that they're they were created by um uh los alamos uh physicists from los alamos headed by murray gelman who was one of uh major uh, nuclear physicists um well, quantum physicists but working on stuff let's say at los alamos and he dragged a bunch of his friends this is when computers were just starting to be able to do the, the sort of stuff that we're talking about with nonlinear dynamics and they were doing that uh, in at first actually for uh, thermonuclear bombs um which is to say because at very high speeds velocities inside the detonating bomb i mean we're talking near the speed of light 
um, or something, you know, something in the percentage of speed of light range where you'd measure it. And in the per what percentage of C, what percentage of the speed of light? Um, things happen so fast, but it still acts like a fluid. And so that, that falls into what's called fluid dynamics, and fluid dynamics falls into um, chaos theory. Uh, primarily, and they were studying chaos theory, and then they started studying complexity theory. And because their work at Los Alamos, I'm going on here, but because their work at Los Alamos um, was primarily military and for, for thermonuclear bombs, um, they, they founded their own institution to study everything else using this, this method. This is Santa Fe Institute. It's in Santa Fe, New Mexico, of course. Uh, they work with... Uh, all sorts of universities around the world for sure good, really good ones and so anyways so yeah i'd look into them and they've got all sorts of courses and stuff you can take i think for free it's really amazing stuff and you can even fly there for the summer and take a course if you're a student you know you can take a whole summer course on complexity dynamics and all this stuff so they started this thing they started studying all these different complex systems and you know figuring out what is and what isn't what kind different kinds of complex systems and what are the different parameters that are good to use um, for modeling this one or that one and it turns out most of the higher order stuff most of the w w what you'd call complicated stuff I mean, there's complicated stuff you know like a, 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 a watch made out of gears you know an old-timey spring you know windy watch like a pocket watch from the 1800s. That's a complicated thing. It's quite complicated, but it's not complex. And its behavior is infinitely predictable, essentially. Well, within the, the tolerance of the clock, right? So if you could make a perfect clock, you know, um, tick-tock kind of clock, like I said, mechanical clock, uh, if you could make a perfect one, it would just tick, tick, tick away perfectly. And... So that's not a com that's not a complex system. It's a very complicated system. It's not complex, and so there are many things that are complicated. But it was very amazing to find out just how many of them were complex. The same the the same dynamic, which colloquially you could call the Kaufman dynamic. I keep going back to him because just amazing work. Uh, I think it's like two. I forget what page of Origins of Order, but he Kaufman basically demonstrates that uh, the thinking in your brain, the functional neural network the operation of a functional neural network, a brain, is mathematically identical uh, to biological evolution in genomes. So what our brain is doing is just what biological evolution does, only much more quickly. Um, and then it turns out, of course, in a different way, but there's still complex adaptive systems, economies function this way. And this is what I was getting at with the minimal, uh, the minimal, intelligence, uh, minimal intelligence system. Uh, with Weisner Gross's model, which is also just, I mean, I think that guy's going to get a Nobel Prize for that. I think he discovered something very fundamental and axiomatic about what intelligence is and how we can define it. And so a system that's made up of many interacting agents with usually the maximal amount of freedom uh, for each agent um, Sometimes not. Sometimes there's too much freedom. And, and that gets to the point where you, you bump into the walls of the system where you say, you know, you need to have a, a rule set in order for the system to even function. Once you bump into the, the constraining, you know, necessity and constraints of the system, then you have to have axiomatic rules. And those probably can't be violated. That's at least you, you have to have that, that level playing field in order to play the game, right? And so that's the limitation, at least as a hard limit. And then, of course, it could be more limited than that, depending on what kind of system it is. So, yeah, I, I just feel that it's very important, especially as our societies are getting more complex, especially as globalization uh, is not going to stop. I hope it does at least stop or very much slow down, but hopefully stop at least for a little while, pause at least, in terms of political uh, centralization. And I think uh, in terms of economics, um, I think that what we've got going on right now is good in general, and I think that it might already be too, both too complex and too centralized, if that's possible. I know that seems like uh, kind of crosstalk, but too complex in the sense that, well, let me put it this way. 
you can, when you centralize things that are already working in a complex way, when you start to centralize them more, uh, then you're at cross you're at cross with you know that complexity. And but I think yeah, it's it's both at the same time right now because what what, what people are doing, the, the people pushing globalism, which I don't think we have to push. This is my point. I, I I'm not against it per se in principle, in the I don't know maybe somewhat far future because we're not talking about right now. These people are demanding right now. Right now, we want, and what they want is a global communist state, which is terrifying. Terrifying, especially looking at what China's doing. They got a million Muslims in concentration camps. You know, organ harvesting, all this sort of stuff that's going on. Why do you think the Hong Kong protesters are protesting? If this, all this stuff ties in. Hong Kong protesters protesting. Let's talk about that. What does that have to do with complexity theory? Well, the artificial intelligence systems... Uh, that the Chinese Communist Party are using to track these people, to see their faces, to track them down. Um, it's artificial intelligence. It's, that's complex adaptive systems theory. All of this stuff ties in. There, there, was a, there was a debate recently on that point. I was talking to somebody and they were saying, um, uh, they were saying, well, because there's an issue with, uh, for example, facial recognition. Uh, when, they, when they train the artificial intelligence on, let's say, a population that's mostly, let's say, Caucasian, right? That's a problem in places like the United States uh, for training these algorithms, maybe. Or let's say maybe you train them all just on Asian people, uh, and and then when they get a, a different face, of course, they don't they don't recognize it as well. This happens in humans as well, by the way. Um, people, I don't know if, if race is a real thing. I mean, it sort of is, sort of isn't. It's blurry, but you know. People of different races uh, have a harder time recognizing people of different races, that is. And so that that's actually turns out to be true in artificial intelligence as well. So it's not something wrong with our brains. It's something that's in, in, in internal to the mathematics and the way that these systems work. Um, so it's not a fault. Uh, it's, it's just the way that this sort of thing works. We, we have the same problem with AI that learn on one uh, ethnicity or something like that one type of face or any any kind of type. It doesn't have to be ethnicity, but that's what we were talking about. And they were saying, oh, we've got to fix this. We've got to fix this. And I said, you realize that, you know, the only goal in the AI can be, it can, it can only be to be more accurate. There is no more, there is no other uh, objective goal other than to be accurate, right? So of course we want to, if you're an AI developer, you want it to be more accurate. But I pointed out that, you know, making it more accurate is going to increase the, um, the, the possibilities of, you know, tyranny against these people. That is to say, you know, it's a discriminatory power. Um, recognition is discrimination. You're discriminating a thing from all other things. It's, it's a discriminatory uh, action. And I mean that in the mathematical sense. You're just, you know, or the, the, the rote sense, the, the sense of process. You're discriminating this one particular thing. This is Joe. Uh, X, right? And Joe X is not, you know, John uh, Y, and he's not Joe Y. He's, you know, Joe X, right? So that's a discriminatory thing. Now, okay, yeah, great. We're going to make the AI better uh, in dealing with who are minorities in, in the U.S. anyways, uh, not in other places, but, you know, dealing with so-called minorities or minorities in the U.S., you know, it's it's going to make it easier for regimes like uh, communist Chinese uh, Chinese Communist Party to do that stuff to them. You know, I made the point. I uh, the point I made. I said, you know, well, assume that the TSA is going to get this at the airports, and you know, you're you're an Arabian guy. You're you're an Ara you're you're an Arabic guy. You know, would you be a little worried because now they can, you know, they let's say their facial recognition system can determine your ethnicity, right? So, yeah, it's it's everything's a slippery slope. And like I said, you can't do anything without risk. And the, the amount of risk globally is, is increasing, while I, I'd say at least in the West, well, and, and generally speaking in places that are, are doing better. I mean, global poverty has been going down. Everything's, everything is getting better. The systemic risk does seem to be increasing. And there you go. There's another thing with the the financial crisis and all the rest. What was that? What was what was the uh, market collapse in what 2007, 2008? 
that was, uh, I mean, th there were causes for the situation that were, you know, political and regulatory and Wall Street and blah, blah, blah. There, there were a few culprits, let's say, government being one and Wall Street being another. And if you want to differentiate between those two, they kind of walk in and out of the revolving doors together. Oh, I'm done being a congressman now. I'm going to go work for Goldman Sachs. <laughs> Yay. Or I work for Goldman Sachs. Elect me as your congressperson. So that was what the financial crash was. It was systemic risk. You heard this a million times. Now, you probably don't hear it much anymore. Um, systemic risk is a real and scary thing. Google, you know, go look up... Um, Go look up the flash crash and what a flash crash is. Uh, a flash crash is the collapse of a complex adaptive system, which is a basically when they have the high frequency trading algorithms all trading at millisecond speed or whatever it is, super high speed. I mean, Christ, they build they build undersea cables to transmit this data. They, they spend billions of dollars just to put in a bigger undersea cable to transmit half a millisecond faster than the other guy across, you know, across the ocean or uh, whatever it is, right? So, you know, all these machines are trading and then it just, you know, something, the wrong trade happens. The, the, it's like Jenga. It's like the, the game Jenga where you push the little blocks out of the tower and yeah, if you push the wrong block, the tower comes down. That's what happens. And that's that's a an endemic uh, issue in complex uh, systems and complex adaptive systems is that. Um, in biology, we call it extinction. Uh, and if your fitness, uh, I mean, in the mathematics of the modeling, if your fitness on the fitness landscape falls too low, you die. Uh, and this is how evolution occurs. Of course, the weaker organisms are weaker for the environment. See, there's no weak and strong. There's no good and bad there. It's whatever the environment necessitates is is what needs to happen and if that doesn't happen you die you know if you're not a camel and you're in the desert you're, you're gonna die uh, but if you're a camel you, you you might be okay you know and they evolved to do that how many camels or proto camels died to make a camel so that's the same with all evolution i know that's kind of maybe a funny one so that's that's what happened in the flash crash is you have this ecosystem of all these trading algorithms and one of them did a trade and then you get, I mean, there's multiple effects. One of them is called the herding effect. There's, there's a bunch of systemic risk effects, you know, and it, when this happens, this is what's called a black swan. And it's a whole long story. It's a funny story. There are no black swans. Oh my God, we went to Australia, there's black swans. But a black swan is an event that cannot possibly be predicted. It's also an event that will happen. Uh, that's a concept in math as well called gambler's ruin. Gambler's ruin is like this. If I'm a gambler and I have $100 and the casino has an infinite amount of money, I will eventually lose all of my money and no longer be able to gamble. I will go extinct. I will go broke. I will be ruined. That's gambler's ruin is what that's called in math. And it applies. The, the world-ending asteroid that's going to hit the planet, the, the world-ending volcano... Uh, that's going to erupt and kill all life uh, and we'll have to start over from amoebas or something. It's coming. It, it's, it's coming uh, for sure uh, at some point if, if the, the earth were to last, you know, infinite amount of time. This is, this is in the infinite limit. But it's coming, right? <laughs> we can have an idea of the probability, but probability is we don't know when. It's like earthquakes or something, but it's coming. It's out there. And it's, it's, it's a possibility. It's a possibility right now, you know. Uh, and so you can't get around that. You can't get around risk. And you can't get around the fact that black swans exist and they're out there and they're lurking behind every corner. Um, so what are you going to do, right? What we can do, I think, is number one, of course, like I said, <clears throat> we have to know what we don't know. We have to be very clear on the boundaries of our knowledge. And that'll keep us in line in terms of being able to try to model these things better. And the only way that we know it's better is we try it. We try different models, different iterations and all the rest. And we see if it's better. And I wish that the way the political climate is now, and I don't, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be not, trying not to be partisan right now. I mean, you could tell my, my general partisanship, but 
you know, anti-communist, let's say, <laughs> anti-fascist, anti-communist, uh, pro-freedom as much as possible within the boundaries of the system parameters uh, have a level playing field. You know, and that works. But, I, yeah, rushing toward globalism, uh, rushing toward eliminating uh, agents within the system, which is to say consolidating them into larger agents, so instead of, you know, Britain can't negotiate its own trade deal, uh, it has to go to the European Union and get approval and just do it through there. You know, that sort of centralization of, of decision making is is what brought down all the socialist countries. Um, one could argue it, it helped bring down the fascists as well. Uh, that's that's it's a bit more complicated, of course, because we're talking about World War II, where the socialist countries we're talking about they just collapsed, for the most part, on their own because they didn't work. Um, you can only force something to work for so long, and maybe you can get it to work for a little while, but you know, gamblers ruin. the the big The big scary Star Wars program that put laser beams in space or whatever supposedly was talked about. They actually did do that, by the way. They just the lasers weren't what you thought they were. It wasn't Star Wars. It turned into another program. But, um, yeah, it's coming. You know, the black swan's coming. Somewhere, sometime, eventually. And so, what does that mean? Um, I think it means that we should all be a lot more careful. I think that it means that we should all do a lot more research. We should make sure, as a first principle, to define... The boundaries of our knowledge and not just our knowledge but human knowledge uh, in science we want to know what is the extent of human knowledge in this area scientifically uh, falsifiably and falsifiability is a huge thing google falsifiability or uh, look at the wikipedia basically if you make a statement you better be able to disprove it with an experiment or somebody needs to be able to disprove it with an experiment uh, if it's wrong so you can't say, you know, there are fairies on the lawn, uh, but they disappear when you look at them. Well, how do I prove or disprove, in particular, in this case, falsifiability means to disprove. Is there any way to disprove the statement, foreseeably? Is there any experiment possible that we can do to find out? And I think that that is a big problem with the climate science thing as well. I would say, so like I said, for example, with the weather, with the whole the, the hurricane thing and all that I went to, but... Um, that is more toward the chaotic end. That is more, you know, there's not really a test to be done. It's like, well, was the weather report uh, or the weather, weather prediction accurate? Um, how accurate was it? Of course, you know, and, but that's only, you know, it's only out a few days or whatever the, the predictions are. Um, when it comes to climate, things get even worse. And unlike weather, uh, because your predictions are only a few days out in advance, Climate is, we're talking years and years and years, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you just think about the, 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 the absolute ridiculous orders of magnitude we're talking about in terms of, of climate. And then yeah, just in terms of time, we're not talking about a couple of days. We're not talking about where a hurricane is going to go. You know, we're talking about much, much more complicated and complex systems with many, many more moving parts. So many moving parts, it's like the stars in the sky. It's insane. And at the same time, unlike weather, where if I say, well, it's going to rain tomorrow from this time to this time, this is how much rain, blah, 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 uh, that I predict. And then, you know, that happens or it doesn't happen or it sort of happens, but I was wrong uh, about this. And I can go back and I can try to figure out why I was wrong and what, I, what mistake I made if I was. Or, you know, maybe say, hey, I was right this time. And so maybe I'm doing something good. But if I'm wrong too much, I might have to tweak some things in my model. But, you know, with climate, we're talking about something over much longer periods of time with many more particles and moving parts. And the, I mean, Jesus Christ, the sun, uh, cosmic radiation plays a role, literally. Cosmic radiation potentially plays a role in climate. And you can't predict that at all. I mean, it's, that's basically random. At that point, you're basically getting into randomness. You can you can just make that random easily, and it won't affect the equations um, because it's just way too far out there and too many, it's just like infinite sources. 
in infinite space almost. <laughs> so it's, it's as close to random as you're going to get, you know, uh, radiation from distant stars exploding or something. But that affects climate uh, in, in certain ways. And frankly speaking, we don't know. Once again, we don't know how much it affects climate. Now, within the short term, within, you know, the short term, does cosmic radiation or bursts of cosmic radiation from extraordinarily distant gamma ray bursters that turn into supermassive black holes, hypernova, uh, you know, randomly hitting the earth from all certain, you know, sorts of directions, not technically randomly, but it's as close to random as you're going to pretty much get in the universe. And <clears throat> we know that that is going to affect our global climate to some degree. And we have no idea really how much or how over long periods of time in short periods of time we don't know but this is the sort of thing that i that i'm really trying to get at is that that you know these are black swans in a sense like th these are things that we not only do we not know and can't not only can we never predict uh cosmic radiation bursts and stuff like that not only can we, can we pretty much never predict it um fully or, or even close to it but at the same time we still have no idea what kind of effects it has and i'm not saying that it has a large effect i'm just making a point i'm just saying we don't know we don't know long term at least what the effects are short term probably not much um but that's that's sort of an issue and, and the other problem with climate science so there's two main problems you know the first one is what i just said um about just the, the scale being so much greater than weather and how inaccurate weather reports tend to be. Um, and then at the same time, unlike weather, you can't really test it because you need a, lo a lo much longer period of time in order to see the results of what actually happened and compare it to whatever models you had made years ago. And frankly, from what we see right now, especially with the, um, uh, the IPCC, uh, they're continually revising their reports down and downgrading the amount of warming. So that's a trend. Now, that doesn't mean anything either, a trend in that respect necessarily, but it could. And it seems to have been going on for quite a long time where they keep having to revise it down and where we're not seeing the predicted uh, drastic warming or drastic effects. Like I said, ocean acidification is a huge problem. Um, and global climate change from, you know, anthropogenics, you know, forcing is probably at least a problem. Again, the question is how much. And again, the models have not been that great. And this goes to the same thing. I mean, you know, I don't care about consensus. I mean, everybody agreed that Einstein was wrong until he was right. And, you know, everybody agreed that, you know, um, uh, you know, Heisenberg was freaking crazy. Einstein thought he was crazy. <laughs> Einstein thought Heisenberg was nuts. <laughs> Heisenberg thought Einstein was nuts. And I don't give a crap about how many scientists you can find to fill out a survey, if they're even climate scientists. I think the survey needs to start with, um, you know, define complex adaptive systems theory and blah, 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 and all the stuff I've just been telling you. If you can't, if you can't say you know, if you can't spout off the, the stuff that I've been saying, and I'm not, you know, I'm not even, my focus was uh, 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 neuroscience, neuropsych, you know, physics as well. So uh, brains, brains are my forte. Hence, you know, I have to be fairly versed in complexity science as well for that, because that's also complex adaptive systems uh, science. But yeah, I, I, I don't. Who are they polling? Who, what do they know? Are these people even any good? Well, you know, and 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 why are they always wrong? Right? That's like asking why the weatherman's always wrong. But so yeah, these these issues surrounding this uh, previously pretty obscure mathematical theory that was only used by physicists and you know uh, actually literally rocket scientists and all all sorts of stuff like that. Like I said, fluid dynamics. Um, it is, it's becoming one of the most important fields uh, in mathematics, at least, and, and in, well, in um, practical mathematics, in applied mathematics, anyways, when it comes to social systems, economic systems, politics, etc. That is the scientific way to, to look at these systems because all of those systems are complex adaptive systems. And the agents within the systems 
uh, so social systems are also in and of themselves complex adaptive systems. How the cells that make up their neurons, <laughs> their neurons are in and of themselves complex adaptive systems. So it's, it's turtles all the way down. It's CAS turtles all the way down. They, they all got a big CAS complex adaptive system, CAS stamp on their backs, on their shells, and they're, it's just turtles all the way down um, to a point. <laughs> then you get to quantum mechanics, but that might be too, if you ask, um, if you ask uh, Suskind, Leonard Suskind about it, uh, and his, his, what is it, the Stanford Theoretical Physics Working Group, something like that. If you ask them about quantum gravity theory and, and you know, uh, Planck scale level quantum entanglement creating space-time and uh, just basically creating space-time and also creating the gravitational uh, warp, warpage of space-time, uh, if, you, if, if you think space-time is just entanglements between quantum particles on an event horizon. <laughs> So, but yeah, it, it, it it's it's getting into quantum, it's seeping into quantum uh, mechanics too, especially through quantum com computation, uh, through um, quantum logical information theory uh, or quantum information theory. Um, so yeah, it, it might actually be turtles all the way down <laughs> and it might be turtles all the way up. <laughs> freaky thought, really freaky thought. Forgive me, God. <laughs> Because <laughs> that, I don't know, if it's turtles all the way up, it might be something like that. But, so, it's become very important. That's that's why, that's why I did the first video on it. Also, I've been thinking about it. Also, it kind of, I guess it jogged me, uh, the whole thing with the, the climate thing, and then they're they're going nuts. Yeah, they maybe they're going nuts over over that thing with the, the, the map with Trump with the hurricane because they're trying to link him to the climate thing. I think that makes more sense than anything else, frankly, because they're just what they're saying just makes no sense it's like oh you extended the you know yeah it, you extended the, the thing yeah because it keeps going in a lot of the models you idiot <laughs> like and that's, that's what I was saying it, you know there's two graphs for the spaghetti plot it's not just the the one the spaghetti plot it's also you know which which of those models uh, you know degrades to another to a lower category or increases to another category um, within a certain amount of time and there's a graph for that and you, you need to look at both to determine. So you look at a track, you see the spaghetti plot, you just see the tracks. So you're not seeing what the model actually says. And the models diverge. Some of the models go down really quick, like the hurricane hits land, it fades. But Florida's really thin uh, and I've lived there uh, in Tampa and I've been through a hurricane before. And that was, um, what was that one? Irma that came all the way up, straight up through the middle of the state and it was still a category one when it hit Tampa even though it had gone through the entire state going across and that was going across long ways going across short ways um, east to west it's not going to slow it down very much at all if it had gone that way could it have hit Alabama well crap the damn thing got up to a five went down to a two game up back up to a three might have gone down to a two after crossing over Florida or maybe even a one but it it would have kept going and you know the idea that these spaghetti models are really that accurate uh, and the idea that extending it just for safety when you're the president and your job is to make people safe and it could technically black swan over to Alabama, exact, that, that's why it's so ridiculous to me, exactly why it's so ridiculous to me. These people have no idea what they're talking about in terms of weather prediction, in terms of uh, any of the models, in terms of the math behind the models. Uh, frankly, you know, Trump was actually actually absolutely right. Now, he does, he does do some really stupid stuff. He says a lot of stupid stuff for sure, but this was not one of those things. <laughs> uh, you know, I got to give him credit for, for, for that one, at least. And, and for defending himself. Conti he's continuing to defend himself uh, over that because I don't disagree. I think that it, that was a, a good thing. That was uh, being conservative, as it were, which is to say being cautious. And with something like that, you know, you know, you, it's like throwing a, broom, a boomerang. You, you think you know it's coming right back to you. You think you know where it's going to go. You don't know anything. There's wind up there. Um, so that was a pretty long rant, I guess. Um, 
I just kind of felt that there was more to say. I think I pretty much covered a lot of that stuff, actually. I mean, just uh, touching on it. Um, but it is important to know, like I said, financial crash, um, climate, weather, all this stuff, it's all, it's all connected by the same sort of mathematical theory and the same types of models, in general at least. And it's something that I think that people really do need to know about now and apply to politics because that's with the political, <clears throat> with the political landscape becoming as polarized and divergent in, a, in, in at least in the United States and the West, actually, the West, especially with this globalism thing. And that, that's what's happening in the U.S. as well. That and, and socialists <laughs> versus, versus capitalists, I suppose. Uh, amazing, you know, the Cold War ended, and here we are again, yay. Thank you, Anatoly Galician, for warning us. We didn't listen, but yay. <laughs> Anyways, I guess the the final point would be, um, if you're not if you're not on an extreme side, trying to accelerate uh, globalism and unify the world under some sort of a centralized control, in particular, if you're a communist or something like that, where you, you want to control the economy as well. Um, it's it's one of those things that will likely completely upset the apple cart. And that's not good because centralized systems don't actually work very well in producing things. And we're eliminating the uh, general intelligence of the society as a whole, This this sort of uh, emergent hive mind in a sense it, it does it does exist and if you do that and you replace it with just I don't know a politburo or a, a group of so-called experts um, determining you know this and that and what what's produced and who gets it and all this communism um, <clears throat> you, you lose that you lose the dynamical system effect you lose the emergent behavior um, and it's, it's just important for people to understand that and also just understand it in general just because it applies to so many things. So, yeah, I don't know. What's the happy medium? Um, if we do have these the, this scientific uh, understanding, these mathematical tools and ability to create better models, as we adapt as well. We adapt by creating better models. And... You know, if, if we can do that in a way and, f and figure out how to navigate the landscape, the, the international, political, and um, economic as well landscape, then maybe we can actually find solutions. Maybe we can actually agree on them instead of just calling each other, uh, you know, stupid head and whatever, um, and assuming that the other side is just bloodthirsty lunatics or whatever. <clears throat> I think that a lot of this comes from a, a fundamental misunderstanding of one, how our current system actually works uh, at, at, that, at this level. And then, you know, you need to know that uh, in order to get to the next step, which is, well, what can we actually do and how can we actually do it? And even then, even if we, let's say we all get together and sing Kumbaya, and hold hands and say, okay, we're going to use falsifiability, the scientific method, and, you know, the best modeling we can come up with to try to figure out what this will do, what that'll do. I mean, they're doing that in the climate thing, but like I said, there's no empirical, there's, the feedback is too slow to, you know, do experiments, let's say, like you can. Weather is an experiment every day, I guess. Uh, climate, you got to wait for the results, so you don't know. Um, but if, if we, even if we did do that for the things, let's say we can test, you can test the economy. Like I said, J.D. on Farmer made millions of dollars with his virtual stock market because uh, that's a little bit different. It doesn't have as many variables. Uh, it's, it's a simple game, as it were, instead of being composed of all these atoms moving around and so forth, <laughs> affected by, you know, one, one photon from the sun can bump the atom. And it's all these things happening at the, at the chaotic level. Uh, underneath, whereas in the stock market you have that, but you have a very rigid system of rules as well. Um, so it's a little different. But if we could do that in a way where we could all agree, hold hands, sing kumbaya, decide to, you know, be intellectually honest and scientific um, and mathematically rigorous, I think we can come at least to the point where we can, you know, not call each other 
bad names and at least have a conversation of what actually could be done, um, you know, rather than all of this political infighting and all these propagandistic, you know, uh, statements and rhetoric and so forth. Well, I'll do this again. It's kind of fun, just open form. And thanks for listening.